Hi, everyone. Welcome to the channel. My name is Nick Cosgrove, and I'm back with this week's No Filter Q&A. This is the episode where I answer all questions related to diet, training, and supplementation that I received over the last seven days from our in-house clients, online clients, as well as a few of our online followers. Remember, if you have any questions related to your nutritional plan, workout program, supplements you're currently taking, not taking, considering taking, please feel free to email me those questions at nick at foreverfitperformance.com, or you can DM me on my Instagram at fitcosgrove underscore. All right, let's get started with this week's No Filter Q&A with question number one. <clears throat> nick, are Zevias okay to drink? I have anywhere from two to three cans each day. Uh yeah, in my opinion, Zevias are fine. There's really nothing dangerous or anything unhealthy in them. You're basically just looking at citric acid, uh, citric acid carbonated water, a uh, few uh, natural flavors, and of course, the Zevia extract leaf, right? For those that don't know, Stevia is actually part of the sugar cane itself. Zero calories uh, or very, very little calories. It depends on what type of brand you buy, but it's very, very low. Like we're talking like for one package, like three calories, two calories, and it's actually natural, okay? So it's much healthier for you than regular processed sugar, much healthier for you than those artificial sugars like Equal, um, um, what's the other one, Splenda. Those are terrible for you, right? So those are things that you want to avoid. Um, so usually I do recommend to clients who like to have pop every once in a while, like a, whether it's like a Diet Coke or a regular Coke to try to switch over to something like the Zevia. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people don't like the, the aftertaste of Stevia, which is inside Zevia. Um, so it's very sweet for a lot of people, right? And so it really depends on your taste buds. For me personally, I like the taste. I don't find it to be too sweet. I enjoy it. I put stevia itself in my morning coffee um, and I put stevia in my oatmeal, right? So it, it gives, gives a little bit of good uh, taste, makes things a little bit sweeter for me, but it's not too sweet. So it really depends on your taste buds. But honestly, there's nothing wrong in my opinion with consuming uh, Zevias. I, I would try to limit it to, to like two cans a day though. I wouldn't do more than that because everything in moderation and you just have to be careful of really anything, right? So you shouldn't be consuming an abundance amount of it, but two cans a day, even three, it's not going to do any harm. No. So I see nothing wrong with that. Um, and if you haven't already, I would give it a shot, especially if you are someone that does like to consume uh, pop on a regular basis, because this is a much healthier option for you. Okay. So Zevias, they're widely available now. You can pick them up places like Costco. Here in Vancouver, we have them available at places like IGA, Nestor's, uh, Safeway carries them. So they're becoming widely available to the public now. Um, a little bit more expensive than going to buy a regular uh, can of Coke, but you know what? It's worth it because it is much healthier for you. All right. Uh, next question. <clears throat> Nick, if I'm trying to lose weight, would it make more sense to consume all my carbs in the morning and then just protein and fat for the remainder of the day? Good question. Um, so this is one thing I always tell people that work with me on their nutritional plans is that meal timing and meal sequencing is irrelevant. Okay, Our bodies don't work on a clock from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and we have to have this meal at this time, this meal at this time. It doesn't work like that. Okay, So again, that's bro science, like the whole no carbs after 6 p.m. Your body is not necessarily going to burn more carbs when you're sitting in the office working behind a computer than you would at home sitting down watching TV or going to bed, okay? So timing of meals is really not that important. The only time of day that I recommend really being specific with your meals is before your workout and after your workout, okay? So if you're someone who responds well to being uh, on training on somewhat of an empty stomach, then obviously you don't need food. But if you're someone who trains later in the day, you might need something in your stomach. And in that case, I do recommend a complex carbohydrate source with a lean protein. Post-workout, complex carbohydrate source, lean protein, and healthy fat, okay? So to get back to your question though, when it comes to meal timing as a whole, I would not recommend, I mean, you could, you could do that if you want to have your carbs at the first part of the day, then front load your carbs and have your fats and protein, but it's not going to help you lose fat any faster. It won't. At the end of the day, it does come down to your overall caloric intake and your macronutrient intake. So if you're having 300 grams of carbs a day, regardless if you're having those 300 grams first thing in the morning, or you're having them spread out evenly between six meals, you're still going to lose weight if that's your caloric deficit that you need to be in. I'm just throwing 300 grams as an example. Okay. So one thing I always tell clients is if I put like, say six meals on a nutritional plan, I'll say, I don't care what time of day you have these meals. If you want to have meal six for breakfast and you want to have meal one for dinner, go for it. If you want to have three meals in two hours, 
do it. I see nothing wrong with that. Okay. But as long as you get all six of those meals in 24 hours, that's what's important. And a lot of people will like that because it makes the dieting process a lot more flexible for them, more convenient for them. They're like, oh, I don't have to eat every two or three hours. Oh, I don't have to try to, you know, have this meal at this time and have this meal at this time. Oh, I don't have my salmon and rice, but I'm, you know, melt for dinner, whatever it is. You don't have to worry about it. As long as you're getting those six meals in, in this case, I'm using six meals as an example, but if it's five meals or four meals within a 24 hour period, that's what matters. Okay. So there's no science saying that, you know, having carbs later on in the day is going to cause you to gain body fat. Uh, at the end of the day, if you're active on a consistent basis, you're going to the gym on a regular basis, your me metabolic rate overall, you will be burning calories throughout the day. So you're going to be burning calories at 6 a.m. You're going to be burning calories at 6 p.m. So it doesn't matter what time of day you take these carbohydrates in at, okay? So that's what my recommendation is. Don't get caught up in all the minute details. Don't try to say, okay, I have to have all my carbs in before, let's say, 12 o'clock in the morning and then have my fats and protein in the afternoon. You're not going to lose fat any quicker. I promise you. Okay. That doesn't happen that way. Okay. If you're following a clean diet, you've dialed in your diet, you've dialed in your nutritional plan, you're doing your cardiovascular, you're doing your weight training on a regular basis, you will lose weight. Okay. You have to adjust the diet accordingly, though. Okay. So if you're not losing weight on your diet, then you've got to make changes and you got to make revisions. And that's why when I work with people online, I make weekly revisions for nutritional plans because you can't follow the same program for 16 weeks your body will hit a plateau. So you need to constantly keep changing the plan. That doesn't mean always dropping calories. Sometimes that even means increasing calories, rotating macronutrients. So I would not advise you to front load your carbohydrates for a simple reason. If you do that, your insulin levels are most likely going to crash later on in the day because carbohydrates will spike your blood sugar levels. So that's why I wouldn't recommend it. It's going to be very difficult to do that. Um, but I mean, if your body responds better to that and you enjoy that more, by all means do it. But my recommendation would be to spread your carbs out evenly throughout the day. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Nick, I'm 57 years old and want to start taking better care of my body. Am I too old to start lifting weights or would it be better for me to do aerobic activities instead? Um, honestly, it's never too old to get into the gym. I've had people start working out with me when they retired. So, you know, they get into their 60s and now they've retired from work and they've got extra time on their hands. So they start coming to the gym and they want to work with a trainer. And they're in four or five times a week and they love it. So I never tell people it's too late. The, the problem is, though, is that if you do wait too long, it obviously becomes more challenging because the longer you put off going to the gym, the older you get, the ramifications are going to be more severe, right? You could end up with osteoarthritis. You could have heart conditions. You could have a chronic back pain, right? You could have cardiovascular disease. So these are all things that you can avoid, potentially avoid by getting into the gym at an early age, right? So you're taking care of your body, you're taking care of your health, you're keep making your muscles stronger, you're keeping your joints and ligaments all uh, lubricated, right? So it's all about longevity. Okay, so I never tell someone it's too late. I do tell people though, if you're starting at a later age in life, it's going to be more of an uphill battle, as opposed to someone who's starting in their 20s, or maybe even their 30s, because you have more mileage on your body, you have more wear and tear on your body. Right. And you probably notice and you're, you're getting into your late 50s, you probably do have some more aches and pains along the way. That's very common. OK, so I always tell people that work with me, especially the people who are now nearing into their uh, you know, 60s, 70s. A lot of the baby boomers who are now retiring, who are coming to work with me because, again, they do want to start taking better care of their body. It is an uphill battle. OK, and as long as you're patient and as long as you don't have an ego and you don't get focused on trying to go from zero to 100 overnight, you can progress. Now, how far can you progress? Well, that's up to you, right? That's going to depend on your genetics, your lifestyle, and what you're willing to put into your workouts, what you're willing to put into your diet, right? But I promise you, it's never too late. So whether you're starting in the gym at 15 or whether you're starting to the gym at 85 years old, it's never too late. It's just important that you find a program that is customized for you. And that's why, again, I strongly advise, shameless plug in here, but for people who are starting off in the gym to work with a personal trainer, it's going to fast track you, okay? If you go into the gym and you don't really know what you're doing, you're going to risk injury. If you're just watching YouTube videos and trying to copy what you see on YouTube, you're going to risk injury. Even people who work with me online, I do recommend when they follow my online coaching apps with tutorial videos, I do recommend they work with the trainer in person to at least teach them how to do those exercises correctly if they do not know how to do them already, okay? It's, it's crucial, okay? Because it all comes down to form and technique, proper breathing patterns, all this is crucial if you want to not just get results with your body, but if you want to stay injury-free and you want to last, 
okay? Because if you get injured, you can't train. If you can't train, you're back to square one, okay? So that's why I recommend people hire a trainer, especially if you're a beginner, especially if you're not too sure what you're doing. If you can't afford a trainer, just book, you know, six sessions. I promise you, if you're with a good trainer, those six sessions will make all the difference and set you up on the good path to go in the right direction, okay? As opposed to starting with no idea what you're doing, you get injured, now you're going in the wrong direction, okay? So that's my recommendation. Um, again, if you have any questions with regards to personal training sessions, whether it be in person or online, you can always reach out to me at nick at foreverfitperformance.com or you can DM me on my Instagram at fitcausegrove underscore and I'm happy to help you out. All right. Okay, next question. Uh, Nick, how has your diet changed now from when you competed in bodybuilding competitions? Well, now that I no longer compete, I get to eat a lot less food, which I truly enjoy. Because when I used to compete, whether it was the off-season or contest prep, I had to eat a lot of food. Um, I have a very fast metabolism. So even when I was dieting for shows, I'd have to consume easily 9 to 10 meals a day. Um, at the peak of my off-season, I was doing probably about 1,000 grams of carbs per day. And during my contest prep, I was doing about 500 grams of carbs per day, pretty much right up to the week of the show. Um, and now that's not very common for a lot of people, especially people who have slower metabolism. So you have to obviously tweak a diet for your metabolism. Uh, but I learned from a very young age that I have a very fast metabolism, especially when I started lifting weights as a teenager, my metabolism just sped up more and more. So I had to eat a lot of food. Now that I'm no longer competing though, and I weigh a lot less, I don't need all that food. So I consume about anywhere from six to seven meals per day. Um, and I would say that now at this point, I'm consuming probably about 300 grams of carbs per day. Um, the fats are probably around 100, 120 grams per day and protein is about 200 grams per day. Um, and I find that's more than enough for me. I don't need more food than that. Okay. Actually, I feel that I actually train better with less food now. Um, and I sleep better with less food. I, I, I like to always be a little bit hungry. I find that my performance in the gym and on the floor with clients is much better. I think more clearly with less food. So I never overeat. And that's where it comes down to, even to this day, even though I no longer compete, I still portion out all my meals. I still measure out all my meals. And that's just something I've become accustomed to now, right? So it, I would say that overall, I've probably taken everything down in half. Some things I've been probably cut down by three quarters. Um, it's just because I don't need it right? Um, so you have to adjust your diet accordingly as you get older. And as your goals change, I'm no longer trying to compete for a bodybuilding show. So there's no reason for me to be consuming 400 grams of protein or a thousand grams of carbs per day, right? If I were to go back to doing competitions, I'd probably have to start increasing my calories again. Um, but the one thing that hasn't changed is the food. The food is the exact same. I still eat the exact same foods now that I did when I competed. I still have my eggs. I still have my egg whites. I still have oatmeal. I still have beef time to time. I have yams. I have quinoa. I have salmon. I have cod. I have chicken. Those are things I haven't taken out of my diet. So the foods actually stay the exact same. I've just cut the portions down. Um, and like I said, I feel great with that. I don't need more food. So it's not necessarily, and for me, it was never about, I never found dieting to be difficult because I always enjoyed those foods. So a lot of people, you know, they always feel they need more variety. I'm not one of those people. I can eat the same thing every day. That's me. I'm not a food person. But um, that's pretty much it. I mean, I haven't really made that many changes except my portion sizes. So this is why it's crucial that as you get older, just like you adjust your diet and your nutrition, you also adjust your workout programs, right? So I don't train the exact same in my now in my late 30s as I did in my early 20s. I still do a lot of the same exercises, but I might do different types of weights. I might do different types of rep patterns. I might do more drop sets, supersets, circuit training, giant sets. So I train up my, my I change up my training as well as I get older, okay? So I think it's important to constantly be able to reinvent yourself uh, with your diet and your training and adjust accordingly as you get older and you put more mileage on your body. All right, uh, Nick, I watched your video on cable crossovers and get why you say not to cross the cables. My question is, why do you think most people continue to do this exercise wrong? Um, okay, so crossing the cables is not necessarily wrong. If you go to my Instagram, I put up a video recently on Friday with regards to cable crossovers. And I understand that cable crossovers, most people in the gym will take the cables and they will cross over. The problem I have with that is once you cross the midline of the body, you're using more anterior deltoids. 
your chest is a small muscle group. All you have is what we call pec major, which is responsible for your presses, and pec minor, which is responsible for your flies. That's it, okay? So in order to get the most out of your chest workouts, you have to maximize your angles. So you can do a low incline, you can do a high incline, you can do a flat bench, you can do some low incline flies, and throw in some cable crossovers. Now, why do people do cable crossovers wrong? Again, not wrong, but just, in my opinion, not the best way to do them, because if you are doing the way I demonstrate, which is just bring your hands together like a regular dumbbell fly, you're going to get the best possible contraction in both pec minor and pec major. So why do people cross them over? Well, it's kind of like the monkey see, monkey do, right? Look at the name of the exercise. It's called cable crossovers. So people just assume, well, it's called cable crossovers, and we see so many people doing it, so we should just cross them. So if you actually study basic human anatomy and physiology, you'll see that when you're doing any movement for the chest, any flying movement, the contraction actually ends at the midline of the body. So there's no reason to go past here. Like you might still feel your pecs contract, but you're actually using your shoulders to bring them in. So you're risking damage on your anterior deltoids and rotator cuffs by taking them into a plane of motion that's not natural. So that's why I advise people not to cross the cables while performing cable crossovers, okay? I advise people to perform cable crossovers the same way as they would a dumbbell fly, which is bringing the your hands or the cables in this case together, stopping in the midline of the body, giving it a quick hold and then release. Okay. So a quick pause. That to me is the most effective way to stimulate muscle fibers in both pec minor and pec major. I'm not saying crossovers are wrong with people crossing over. I'm just saying that in my opinion, you get a better contraction, a better stimulation of the muscle bellies and therefore better results. If you do it where you stop in the midline. Okay. So like I said, people do them wrong because they see all these other people doing them. Some people with great physiques do them wrong as well. But remember, just because someone has a great physique doesn't necessarily mean that he or she knows what they're doing on every single exercise. That could just be a combination of genetics, years and years of training. So they built up that solid, lean, dense muscle from other exercises and potentially the usage of anabolic steroids. So don't just assume because someone's in great shape that they know everything. Just like don't just assume because someone is not in great shape that they might not have something to offer, some advice to offer to you, okay? Yes, people should practice what they preach, but I've worked alongside some people who are in amazing shape and they don't know what the hell they're doing in the gym. They just got great genetics. They got they got youth on their side. And at the end of the day, a lot of times there is some drug usage as an anabolic steroid usage going down there too, which can make a big difference in someone's physique. All right. Okay, uh, next question. Nick, how can I get jacked? I don't want to take any steroids, but I would like to add on 25 to 30 pounds of muscle. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the term jacked. And uh, just like I'm not a big fan of the term bulking or cutting. But by jacked, if you mean you want to get, you know, big and muscular, well, if you're going to do it naturally, you're going to have to eat. And you have to eat a lot of food. Okay? As I mentioned in my previous when I, uh, question, when I used to compete, I was having 10 meals a day, 1,000 grams of carbs per day but good carbs, good protein, good fats. That's very difficult to do when you're consuming healthy food, clean, healthy food. It's very easy to consume a thousand grams of carbs if you're having McDonald's and KFC, but if you're having like chicken and rice, you're having yams, sweet potatoes, cod, salmon, that stuff is actually not very high in calories. So aren't and carbs and, and fats and protein. So you actually, well, actually it's high in protein, but it's not very high in fats and carbs. So you've got to eat a lot of that food to jam in all those grams of carbs and all those grams of protein, and all those grams of fat. So it's a lot. So if you, but if you're serious and you want to put on size, you have to eat. At the same time, you want to make sure that your weight training sessions are intense and that you're still doing your cardiovascular endurance training on the side because you don't want to get sloppy. I've seen a lot of guys and women in the off season just eat, eat, eat. And they're not doing any cardio. They're not doing any intense workouts. They're, they're moving very slow in the gym. And a lot of the weight they put on is fat. So you always have to assess your physique. So as you start to put on weight, you have to monitor. You have to look in the mirror and say, okay, am I putting on good weight or am I putting on bad weight? And if you're putting on bad weight as in fat, well, then you need to adjust your diet. You might have to scale things back a little bit. You might have to maybe lower your fats, increase your carbs, or decrease your carbs, increase your fats. That will depend on your body type. Are you an ectomorph? Are you a mesomorph? Are you an endomorph? Are you a combination of two? So all those factors you have to take into consideration when you're putting together a nutritional plan. Again, why it's crucial, not crucial, but why I think it's important to work with someone that can help you with your nutritional plan, who has that experience that can take you from point A to point B, okay? Because um, like I said, I've talked about this in the past, anyone can lose weight. Losing weight is super easy, okay? But are you losing quality weight, right? 
Are you losing muscle or are you losing fat? Or are you losing water? So anyone can gain weight too, but is the weight you're gaining quality weight? Are you gaining muscle? Are you gaining fat? Are you just gaining water? So this is where it comes down to working with someone that can kind of guide you along the way and make sure that the weight you're putting on in your case is only muscle. You might put on some fat because you're going to be in a caloric surplus, but you want to make sure you minimize the amount of fat you put on. And the only way to do that is to constantly assess your physique, as in on a weekly basis, look at yourself, take photos. You don't need to post them on Instagram. They can just be for yourself or for your coach. I've got clients that send me photos bi-weekly, Tuesdays and Fridays. Okay, My American clients send me their uh, check-ins on Mondays and Thursdays. And it helps because... When you're looking at your photos on a week-to-week -week basis, it's very hard to see changes. But when you look at your photos from, let's say, one week, and then you look at them from week number six, and you put them side by side, you can start to see the changes. Regardless if you're going in the right direction or the wrong direction, you will see those changes. So that's what I advise people to do. If you're serious about putting on good quality weight, assess your physique on a week-to-week -week basis, take photos. And if you're unsure of how to get from point A to point B, work with an experienced, knowledgeable, and reputable coach that can help you. Uh, okay, uh, Nick, is there any particular diet that you recommend people follow if they just want to be lean and fit? Uh, yeah, one that is sustainable and realistic. Okay, and I know that might seem like the obvious answer, but it's so true because if you go on a diet that is not sustainable, ketosis, perfect example, what's going to happen is on a ketosis diet, you will lose weight. If your goal is to lose weight, you're going to lose weight on a keto diet. You're going to lose weight fast, okay? Because you're taking carbs out. Carbs hold water. You're going to lose a lot of weight, especially in the first two, three weeks. What happens though with a diet like that, when you go back to incorporating carbohydrates back into your nutritional plan, you put all the weight back on because your body has become so sensitive to carbohydrates. So I'm using keto as an example. Another example is an intermittent fasting, which I've talked about in the past that I'm actually a big fan of intermittent fasting. If you are someone who's going through chemotherapy, radiation, cancer treatments, okay, and I've talked about that in the past, but if you're looking to lose weight, lose body fat and build and preserve muscle, it's actually not an optimal diet to follow, okay, because it puts the body in a catabolic state for long periods of time. Okay, so these are fad diet plans I don't recommend people, okay? Um, so when you're putting together a nutritional plan, you got to put together a plan that is sustainable and realistic. Now, to me, that looks like a plan that's going to have a lot of foods that you enjoy. Now, if you enjoy junk food, no, you're not going to have that. But if you're someone who does like to have the occasional dessert or pastry, a good plan will allow you to incorporate that once or maybe twice a week. Okay, so that's what I mean by a sustainable and realistic plan. Because if you go too extreme on a diet... And I've seen people do this. They go so extreme. They're super motivated to lose weight or to put on muscle. So we do this diet plan that's full of chicken and broccoli and rice seven times a day. And after like three days, they get bored and they get just discouraged. And then they want regular food again. And then they, cook, they come off the diet. So if you're putting in a diet that it might have chicken and rice, but you're only eating it once a day. And then another meal, you can have beef and yams. Another meal, you can have salmon and quinoa. So, you know, you can add spices, you can add olive oil, right? You can add certain condiments, sugar-free ketchup, you can add soy sauce. So there's things to make your meals taste a little bit better, right? So you're not suffering. And that will become a diet plan that is sustainable and realistic and one that you can follow, not just for a few weeks or a few months, but for life. And that's essentially what I do. And what I do with my clients is I try to put them on a plan that they can follow, not just for beach season or getting ready for the summer, none of that nonsense. It's let's find a plan that you will follow for the remainder of your life. And you can make revisions and tweaks along the way. You can incorporate new foods and take out other foods, but let's stay on the path, right? So my recommendation when you're following a nutritional plan, following one that is sustainable and realistic for you, that fits your lifestyle, fits the foods that you like, right? Don't put your diet full of foods that you don't like because you're not going to stay on it, right? I have people that hate, like hate oatmeal. I love oatmeal, but I'm not going to put oatmeal on their plan. They don't like oatmeal. So I might put cream of rice on their plan. I might put Ezekiel bread with peanut butter. I might put carbonyl bread, right, with, with jam. So something where they're getting good complex carbohydrate source, just not oatmeal, right? So you have to find the plan that works specifically for you and only you and follow that plan. So best diet plan, I know I've talked about this in the past, but it is one that is going to be realistic and sustainable to follow for life. All right. Okay, next question. Uh, Nick, I've hit a plateau with all my lifts in the gym. Is there anything I can do that will make me stronger on my exercises so that I can lift more weight? 
Yeah, there's a few things you can do when you hit a plateau with, with weight training, right? And we all hit plateaus. So one thing you could do is for a few weeks, you could try lowering your reps and increasing your weights. Not on every set, but maybe your last set of an exercise. So let's say you're bench pressing 315, right? And you're getting 10 reps with that. Well, you want to take your bench press up to 325. Well, throw on 325 and try to go for six to eight reps. And even though I'm not a huge advocate of single digit reps, if you want to do that as your last set, let's say you've done four or five working sets with double digit reps, save it for your last set. So your, your joints are all warmed up. And then you do that last set of that exercise as six to eight reps and just see if you can push out those extra reps. That's one way to do it. So you're going to decrease your reps, increase your weight for a short period of time. And what you'll find is as you do that, your reps start to go back up again with that weight, okay? So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is take the exercise out altogether. So let's say you're doing your squatting 315 and you've been squatting 315 for 10 years and you wanna go up in weight. Well, take squats, in this case, let's say it's barbell back squats. My recommendation, take barbell back squats out for a month. Do other leg exercises instead. Do hack squats, do leg press, do ball wall squats, do BOSU squats. Okay, so you're still squatting, but take out the barbell back squat for a month, okay? And what that'll do is if you focus on another exercise, you can stimulate more muscle fibers in other muscle groups, right? So then when you go back to the barbell back squat, you might notice you're actually stronger because synergist muscles that assist in the barbell back squat are now stronger, okay? So that's another thing you can do to help get past the plateau. Um, but one thing to remember too, is there's so many ways to increase intensity in the gym that have absolutely nothing to do with increasing your weight, okay? So you can increase intensity by decreasing your rest periods, by adding in supersets, giant sets, like I talked about before, circuit training, right? Um, you could try rest pause sets where you're you know, holding on the negative for a one, two count and then explosive reps on the positive. So there's different ways to increase intensity without increasing the weight, okay? And I always recommend that, to especially my clients who are older, because really, how, how high do you want to go? I talked about in the past how for myself, I stay at 315 squatting. It's a weight I feel comfortable with. I could probably squat more, but at my age, why push it? I feel good. My legs, in my opinion, I've got pretty good developed legs. I feel I don't need to push heavier weight. My joints feel great. My knees feel great. My hips feel great. I have no injuries. So I stay at that weight. But what I've noticed over the years is the way I increase my intensity on my squats is if I'm squatting 315, I don't rest more than 45 seconds to a minute after each set. I go right back in again right? Or I'll pre-exhaust. I'll do some walking lunges. I'll do like eight sets of 42, uh, 32 or 42 reps of walking lunges. So by the time I get in the squat rack, I've done well over hundred reps of lunges. So I pre-exhausted my quads, then try squatting 315. So it's the same weight, but it's more intense. Okay. So just remember that you don't always need to constantly increase your weight in the gym for it to be an intense workout or for you to get results. There's so many other ways that you can increase intensity and get results in the gym without increasing your weight. Okay. Uh, next question. Two more questions. Nick, what's the most accurate way to measure body fat percentage? I want to know how I've been progressing, but I'm not sure how to get my body fat done. Okay. Well, if you want to know how you're progressing, just look in the mirror, right? I, I, I mean... I guess it's nice to know numbers and stats and all this stuff, but when it comes down to it, if you're training for muscle gain and for fat loss, the mirror doesn't lie. And I always tell my clients this. I'm like, just look in the mirror. Are you progressing? No. Okay. So change something, right? I mean, I know sometimes it's hard when you don't see changes and it can be more encouraging when you see the number on the scale drop. I get it. But at the end of the day, if you are training for the aesthetics component where you're trying to lean out and build muscle, it's just going to come down to how you look. So when I do weekly check-ins of people, I do ask them for their weight, but I also ask them for photos because I want to see how they look. If they're still looking like they're holding fat, well, I'm going to cut some carbs or cut some fats, right? If they're looking like they're losing too much weight too quickly and losing muscle, then I'm going to bump up their carbs or bump up their fats or increase their protein. Okay. So go by how you look. But if you really want to get your body fat done, my recommendation is have a personal trainer do it with calipers. Calipers will be your most accurate way to get your, your true body fat percentage done. Okay. Um, now, for me personally, I've never had my body fat taken ever. So when I used to compete, people would ask me as I got closer and closer to the show what my body fat percentage was at. And I, I had no idea. Okay. It didn't matter to me because I was being judged on how I looked. Judges didn't care how much I weighed. Judges didn't care what my body fat percentage was, how hard my workout was, how much cardio I did. I was being judged purely on how I look. OK, 
Okay. So not that you want to be a bodybuilder, but if you are training for fat loss and muscle gain, you obviously care how you look. So go by the mirror. That's my recommendation. Okay. So, but if you really want to know what your body fat percentage, the most accurate way is calipers. I'm not a fan of those scales. Those, I think they're the Tenali scales and that tell your BMI. That to me is all nonsense. That stuff can be somewhat accurate for the average sedentary person because they base it on your height and your weight. But I've talked about this in the past. Someone like me who's five foot 10, I weigh 220 pounds. According to the BMI, I'm obese. Okay. I don't think I'm obese. And I have that same problem with a lot of my clients I train who do pack on a lot of muscle and their BMI say the same thing, but they've got ripped abs, right? So <laughs> there's no way that they're obese. So those formulas work for the average sedentary person. But if you are someone who goes to the gym and you weight, lift weights on a regular basis, you've got to forget about the generic bullshit. Okay. You have to, you have to throw it out the window because it does not apply to you. Okay. So if you really want to get your body fat done, my recommendation is have a personal trainer do it for you. All personal trainers should now have, should know how to take body fat percentages. Even though I don't do it with calipers, I know how to, but I've never had a client ask me because at the end of the day, they're, they just go exactly what I say, go by how you look, go by how you feel. And that's how you know if you're progressing in the gym. All right, last question. <clears throat> Nick, what's the best piece of workout advice you can give me? I'm feeling unmotivated to go to the gym and stay on track with my diet. Um, you know, this is a tricky question because there's so many ways to answer this, but my, my one recommendation to people who are feeling very discouraged when it comes to going to the gym or they have a hard time staying on track with their nutritional plan is you have to think of it like a long-term game. Okay? You can't think short-term. It's good to have short-term goals and long-term goals, but when it comes to the overall uh, components with your nutritional plan, with your supplement protocol and your training regime, you have to think long-term, okay? So it's a long, long-term plan. So that means if you go out and you have a night of drinking, you can't beat yourself up for the next three or four days and go, ah, oh, I just shit the bed on my, my plan. I went out, I got wasted, I'm hungover, and now I want to have bad food, and that goes into three or four days. You have to forget about it. So you know what? I went out, I had a good time, I had a few drinks, I had some bad food, and now I'm ready to get back on the plan the next day or the day after that, okay? Problem is a lot of people, when they slip up once and it goes into two days, they say, well, I can skip another day. Oh, I can have that burger or I can have those fries or I can have another drink. Uh, I've already missed three days in the gym. I might as well just miss the remainder of the week. One week turns into two, two turns to a month and so on and so on. And we've all seen this happen to people in the past. So I always tell people, think of it like a long-term game. You're going to have your wins and you're going to have your losses. You're going to score goals and you're going to have goals scored on you. Okay. But you have to think of it like that long-term, like a season for a, a hockey team or a baseball team. It's a season. You're going to win some games. You're going to lose some games. Some workouts are going to be great. Some workouts are going to suck, right? Sometimes you're going to feel like super motivated and encouraged to go to the gym and stay on track with your diet plan. And other times you're just going to want to sit on the couch and eat potato chips. But as long as you know that you have a long-term goal and that you're going to put in more good days than bad days, you will progress. Okay. So just remember that. Um, that's my advice. Because again, a lot of people, in my opinion, the, the reason why a lot of people don't achieve their health and fitness goals is that they give up too easily. They're not consistent and they're not dedicated and determined and disciplined with their nutritional plan and their training program. Okay. The consistency really is key. And I see this time and time again. I know I sound like a broken record, but I promise you it is key. You can't just go to the gym twice a week and then miss two weeks and go back and train for a week, do three hours of cardio one day and then do no cardio for a week and expect to see concrete results. Okay. It doesn't work like that. You have to be there consistently. You don't have to be in the gym every day. You don't have to be perfect on your diet every day. But if you are consistently at least still talking, operating at about 85, 90%, you're going to progress. Okay. And that's how you stay motivated with your program because everyone likes to progress. So when I have clients and they see the results and they feel the results, that motivates them to continue to go to the gym. That motivates them to stay on track with their diet. That motivates them to dial in their supplement protocol because they're seeing the results. They're feeling the results. So the only way you're going to do that is if you're consistent with your plan and you're staying disciplined with your plan. So that's my advice. Think of it like a long-term plan. <clears throat> on the days you have your slip-ups, forget about it, move on, okay? Don't dwell on those days. 
and don't give in to the fact that, well, I missed two days in a row. I might as well just miss the remainder of the week of the gym or, you know what, I, I, I screwed up. I had a muffin for breakfast and now I might as well just have, you know, a burger and fries for lunch. You might as well have pizza at night because this whole day is going to be a cheat day anyway. Don't do that. Okay. Don't think like that. Think of it like a long-term plan. And in my experience, the people that think like that are the people that achieve the best results with their health and their physique. Anyway, that's it for this week's No Filter Q&A. This episode will be going up on Monday, May the 13th. I believe it's May the 13th. Yeah, Monday, May the 13th. As a reminder, if you do have any questions related to your nutritional plan, workout program, supplements you're taking, not taking, considering taking, please feel free to email me those questions at nick at foreverfitperformance.com. Or you can DM me on my Instagram at fitcosgrove underscore. I want to thank you all for supporting my YouTube channel. Thank you for supporting my online coaching business and our in-house personal training business here in Vancouver, British Columbia. I really do appreciate all the support. Thanks again, and I will see you all next week. Bye for now.